<sighs> it feels so good to take a break from making videos. Actually, that's a lot. This is fucking dreadful. Yeah, taking a break was definitely a right choice, but now I'm just downright procrastinating. But this halfway video I'm working on is gonna be like six hours long. I need a topic that's shorter and I'm still nostalgically passionate about. Wait a minute! This chair I'm sitting on, it's from Build-A-Bear Workshop! I haven't thought about that company in so long, I wonder what they've been up to- Oh. So ever since I got this new plushy body, getting new clothes has kind of been an issue. For some reason, most retailers don't sell in size quintuple XS. And when I went on Build-A-Bear's modern website for online shopping, I noticed something... weird. Build-A-Bear Workshop. The company whose aesthetic embodies peak childhood innocence. Has an adult section. This was a hell of a culture shock, for me at least. Now, you might not know what Build-A-Bear Workshop is, especially if you're from mainland Europe, or Asia, or Africa, or South America. Yeah, Build-A-Bear Workshop only serves specific countries. Mostly the Anglosphere nations, like America, Canada, Britain, Ireland, Australia, and Aotearoa, but there's also some weird outliers like, you know, Mexico, South Africa, the UAE, and Bahrain. So, for the 7.2 billion people who don't have access to a Build-A-Bear workshop, here's a brief recap on what the hell it even is. Build-A-Bear Workshop was created in 1997 by the ex-CEO of Payless Shoes, Maxine Clark. During her tenure, Miss Clark had ambitious dreams of owning a dinky mall store that smelled marginally less terrible than Payless Shoes. As an initial concept, Build-A-Bear Workshop wanted to give children a bigger personal connection to the teddy bears they bought by guiding them through a fantasized version of a toy factory's assembly line. The process started by grabbing a defluffed animal pelt from a bucket there's... there's no non-morbid way to say that. These would be brought to a stuffing machine to help them take shape, and then a felt heart would be added to bring them to life. But the most important step was saved for last. Giving them performatively expensive accessories! This idea was very kitschy and relied mostly off the whimsy factor and the deep wallets of upper middle class parents in the late 90s. And it fucking worked! Babwa was an overnight hit and rapidly expanded from their one location in Missouri to the entire English speaking world. Yeah, excluding Nigeria and India for some reason. The only bump on the horizon was that, uh, well, the early 2000s was about to happen. For many people my age, the early 2000s is very much nostalgically romanticized. It's a time of great aesthetics, creativity, and fun. A time where anything could be possible. But for all the adults in the back, yeah, you know that the early 2000s was not a great time to be alive. Three of the worst economic crises in human history happened back to back. The first being caused by the aftermath of 9-11, the second because all the real estate hedge funds lost at a casino, and the third because someone made the idiotic mistake of trusting the Greek government. That combined with all the wars, writer's strikes, and high school musical twos happening, yeah, it was not a fun time to be alive. Nor a fun time to be a business. At the end of the day, Build-A-Bear Workshop is a luxury toy company. So it's no shocker that with people fighting for even the necessities of life, that a luxury frivolous toy company would sadly have to do amazing and not shut down, what the hell? 
I guess after FAO Schwarz went bankrupt, everyone was kind of just expecting Build Bear to follow suit, but no, actually, the company did really fucking well. Now, I don't actually have any evidence for this, but my working theory as to how Build Bear survived is that their locations are all incredibly themed. They do a lot to sell the immersion of their little uh, workshop aesthetic. And I think in a time period where people couldn't afford to do things like go to Disneyland or go to themed locations or take big trips, but they still desired to do nice, fun, and themed things for their kids, Build-A-Bear was kind of the perfect, like, day trip that didn't cost as much comparatively. Either way, Build-A-Bear Workshop peaked in the early 2000s. And then the coronavirus happened. With how much importance was placed on the company's central gimmick of going physically into a Build-A-Bear Workshop store, they adjusted terribly to the online exclusive shopping space. Even right now, they're not doing great. Their Amazon page is completely fucking dreadful, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Before this, Build-A-Bear did have a website, but it was way less focused on actually selling you the product over the internet and more being a fun activity center for children. It was more so trying to sell children the brand and the world through a bunch of little cute flash games, which thankfully, those flash games have all been archived. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much to the people at Flashpoint. But with the lockdowns in place, Build-A-Bear had to rapidly turn their website into a place for actual shopping. And from a web design aesthetic, it's... it's utilitarian. I get that nobody would trust a fucking shopping website that looks like a Geocities page, but Build-A-Bear has always been about the kitschy aesthetic, so this just feels like an admission of defeat. It's this pervasively cynical idea amongst companies that it's somehow unprofitable to facilitate the imaginations of children. The idea that you don't have to try to market the children, and that since the adults are the ones spending the money, that you should spend all your time trying to impress them. Which brings me to... The Bear Cave. So when you first go on the Build-A-Bear Workshop website, you're greeted with the normal version. The one meant for its target audience of, like, five-year-olds. As I've said before, this layout is very aesthetically barren, there's very little colors or textures, but you know, there's plenty of other video essays that talk about web design, geared towards children, blah blah blah, gentrification. What I'm more focused on is the brands that they're saying are child-friendly or not. If you hover over the Characters and Collections tab, you can see all the brands they've collabed with. I have a graph showing the proportional representation of companies on this website, and it's mostly your average big budget anime kids movie of the era stuff. And there's also some Pokemon stuff, some Hello Kitty collabs, and some original stuff from Build-A-Bear 2, like the Honey Girls movie. <laughs> This was supposed to be a marketing push for their brand, but not only do no bears appear in the trailer, I've never heard a single other human being talk about this, so good, great fucking marketing push, guys. But what we're here for is the bear cave section. On the far right is this tiny indiscernible tab that's no different from the rest of the buttons, but when you click it, you're immediately given a warning. You are about to enter the bear cave. The Bear Cave TM is filled with unexpected collabs and unique plush gifts intended for shoppers 18 and older. Please confirm if you want to proceed. I get they might legally need that, but it just feels out of place, especially when you actually look at the Bear Cave itself. When you open it up, First of all, I might not like this website, but I will say it is a really good detail that the opposite section, intended for an opposite audience, has a reverse color palette of black and yellow as opposed to white and blue. Honestly, that's really fun. Also, this part has a texture in the background, which the main page doesn't. So they can put textures in the background and they just refuse to on the main page for the children that need tactileness to, you know, understand things better. <sighs> Fucking hell. 
And much like the main page that showed brands and little circles that cycle in and out with each season, this also does too, but for the adult collaborations. And as I'm recording this audio, the collabs I see on screen are The Met, Van Gogh Museum, and Swarovski Crystals, which I understand why those are adult themed. Those bears not only are performatively expensive, but they're kind of things that only adults would kind of understand. Kids would like the pretty colors, but they're not going to know what the Met is. Then there's Rick and Morty, which is a show that has the fuck word in it a lot. There's Star Trek, which I don't think used to be an adult franchise, but then Picard decided to go grimdark and show a man getting his eyeball ripped out, so I guess it kind of has its place here. And then Dungeons and Dragons, which... I guess adults are the only ones with the disposable income and retention for a seven hour session. So I guess that works too. But then the one that makes no fucking sense to me, Harry Potter. What the fuck's that doing on the adult side of the section? That's... I get much like Star Trek, Harry Potter also kind of got darker as it went along, but it was never gruesome. And it's still just a fun Wizard Boy franchise. What the fuck is it doing in the adults only section? So we can already start to see a problem here. It's hard to discern what's even adult about this adult catalog. Maybe the After Dark section will help us. This section is what takes up most of the weirdly sexual marketing for the Bear Cave, and it actually has its own characters. You got Jennifer, Barclay, and Paulette. Yeah, it's the usual Build-A-Bear fair with, you know, animals with pun names. So it makes them adult-themed. Well, they're wearing swimwear. Very modest swimwear. They have martini glasses, and, uh... Yeah, alcohol's kind of a weird, pervasive theme throughout the Bear Cave. It's here where they sell the holiday merchandise for St. Patrick's Day and Octo Bear Fest. And I think this is the first concretely adult thing in the Bear Cave. Every other thing up until now, you could debate that, you know, it could still be child-appropriate. So let's add that to the list of concretely adult things that only adults can do. Drink beer. And let's keep the ball rolling and add another thing. Uh, shitty pun t-shirts. Yeah, they have some insipidly rancid designs that don't even feel like Build-A-Bear shirts. They feel like the kind of shirts that a soccer mom with no taste and no personality would buy thinking it's quirky and cute. You got here to spill the tea. Let that shiitake go. Haha, -ha, that sounds like a bad word almost. How unorthodox for a teddy bear. Sun's out, bun's out. Ha 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 ha. Rosé over roses. Okay, yeah, that that is a person shirt that they put on a bear. I refuse to believe that that shirt does not come in people size too. Specifically for shitty drunk mom people. It's wine o'clock somewhere. Not today, Cupid. Party Gras- Mardi Gras is a party. That's not a pun, because it already is the thing! Alright, so clearly these designs aren't made for people like me. Well, they're not made for people, period, but they're not made for the Build-A-Bears of people like me. And that's fine, actually. Uh, from a marketing perspective, I have nothing wrong with them pandering entirely to shitty, trashy, Midwestern newly divorcees. I think it's a little cringe, but hey, I'm not gonna shit my pants over a shirt for a bear not being made for me. Especially when Build-A-Bear does have a section for people just like me. Gay people. Yeah, they have a Pride Month collection. Now, a lot of intellectual types have been making a big stink about rainbow capitalism and the junctioning of consumerism with identity. 
and that maybe it's not the most tasteful thing to take these social movements and try to make them marketable, and that corporations are actually exploiting the gay community by doing this. I would say, however, that Build-A-Bear is doing this right because they have a Galeon. They understand the gay community perfectly. Oh, and also, Build-A-Bear did it. They did the meme. They turned the friggin' frogs gay! Now, the items they have on sale are mostly inoffensive. They're just kind of humorous, rainbow-themed crap. That didn't stop journalists from getting performatively offended for money. Although I will give those journalists some slack, which is never a sentence I've said in my life before, but most of their criticism wasn't towards just the shirts that say, Love Wins. Most of their criticism was for a now-out-of-stock item. A collab item with RuPaul's Drag Race that- uh, Oh, uh... Well, I used my Alex Jones clip too early. My first thought upon seeing this was that, oh boy, I can't wait for the alt-right media to have a normal one about this. And yeah, I was right. Not happy about the fact that I was right, but I was right. Okay, so the final tab on the website is... confusing. But like, not even really confusing in an interesting way. This tab is called Dress for the Decades, and supposedly has different outfits for your bears based on different time periods. And that is actually a really cool idea for a line of accessories. Throughout American history, there's been so many unique fashion trends with their own distinct styles that could be interpreted as designs for these bears, and you already know that they didn't do fucking anything with this concept. So two of the designs are flat out labeled with what decades are supposed to be, the 80s and the 1920s. But the rest are kind of more up for interpretation. I think this skater is supposed to be the 90s. This tracksuit is supposed to be the 70s and 2000s? I genuinely don't know what the fuck's happening here. These outfits don't even really feel like they're supposed to be part of one cohesive line. It just seems like the theme's an excuse to get rid of some random-ass stock that they didn't know how else to classify. And this pervasive pointlessness permeates the bear cave. Especially since there's this... How the fuck do I even phrase this? Okay, so you know how the entire conceit of this special page is that it's for 18 plus shoppers, and that these items are meant to be kept out of the reaches of younger shoppers or people intending to buy for them, right? What if I told you every single item on the Bear Cave is just on the regular website? When you click on one of the product listings in the Bear Cave, it brings you to a page on the normal site to buy it. And if you use the search function on the normal website, you can find every single item on the Bear Cave. So what is the point of this section if it isn't gating away the adult content? Ah, I'm gonna kill myself! Is it just a psychological thing so that adult shoppers don't feel bad that they're buying a baby toy? and that the products being listed are specifically marketed and curated for them? No, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's the only reason. And I personally think that speaks to a strange facet of collector culture. The market Build-A-Bear Workshop is trying to tap into here isn't a new one by any stretch of the imagination. The adult toy collector market started all the way back in the 1960s, which might be a shocker to some people since the brands that we associate with the aesthetic of being a nerd didn't exist back then. But this market didn't begin with superheroes, it began with sports stars. Bobbleheads of popular athletes at the time were the first example of a toy with a specific adult market in mind. Before this, toys were specifically marketed towards children because the main utility of a toy was developing good manners in children. Baby dolls were created to teach little girls how to be good mothers when they grew up, and toy guns were created to teach boys how to be good subservient soldiers when they grew up. Yeah, I probably should have prefaced that when I said good manners, I meant 
good manners in the eyes of the 1830s. But bobbleheads changed the game by, one, being made of more vulnerable materials like paper mache or porcelain, and two, being designed around the idea that they weren't played with, but they were just stuck on a shelf for a car dashboard. And it worked! People love bobbleheads! And it gave the economy of the state of Washington a second lease on life. But this entire time, bobbleheads were coasting off the likenesses of athletes. So one company saw the clear untapped potential of selling bobbleheads based off of pop culture characters. But then I guess springs got too expensive or something, so they just decided to omit the bobbling feature and made big-headed vinyl figures. Called Funko Pops. And Funko easily ushered in what we see as the modern-day nerd toy market. Well, there are other companies like McFarlane, NECA, and SH Figuarts that also do this kind of stuff, but that's more luxury end toy. When it comes to normie bullshit, Funko is easily the king. And I bring all this up because I believe that Funko and Build-A-Bear have the same underlying issue that's plaguing their success. Last June, Funko lost the license to their biggest franchise cash cow that they made pops out of. It was for some weird indie game called Five Nights at Freddy's, I've definitely never heard of it. Now, this was a very big deal for Funko because the FNAF franchise was so big that they used it to pilot test other toy lines. A test pilot, you fucking dumb cunt. The buying power of the FNAF fandom was big enough that they could risk trying a new idea without losing profit margins. But now without FNAF, they're kinda fucked. I mean, they have that new video game coming out and a movie in the pipeline, but when it comes to their figures, their main form of income, they've lost the room to innovate. They're stuck with the pops and the mystery minis until they do something stupid like buy Super 7 Kid Robot or Numskull. I'm calling my shot. They're absolutely gonna do one of those things. They're gonna buy one of those companies. And now that you know the power that just one franchise can have over a company like this, I want you to remember that graph I showed of Build-A-Bear's partnerships. Think about how little of Build-A-Bear is owned by Build-A-Bear. Of course Build-A-Bear is trying its best to create its own original brands, but one of them was the Honey Girls and we know how that fucking went. They also have a line of smaller plush animals called Mini Beans, which I think are trying to recapture the magic of Beanie Babies. Good luck. And then they have the Skooshers, which are trying to compete with the monopoly that is Squishmallows. Good luck. So even before Build-A-Bear threw their tiny hat into the adult collector market, they were still suffering from the biggest problem that big companies in this field have. Not being able to generate internal value and relying off of licenses. Now it seems to me at least that Build-A-Bear is basically doubling down on this licensing issue and they've decided to solve their reliance on licenses by acquiring more licenses. And I honestly think that's not the way you want to go about this. This might seem like a weird recommendation to make, but hear me out. Build-A-Bear, if you're watching this, market to people who don't own Build-A-Bears. And I don't mean to try and find new customers, I mean try and sell your accessories to people who aren't going to put them on Build-A-Bears they're gonna put them on other plushes. Because think about it, Build-A-Bear clothing is compatible with most other plushes that are of the same size as it. Hell, they fit on me! That's why I even still give a shit about Build-A-Bear anymore, because it's the only place that sells clothes of my size. I think if Build-A-Bear did some guerrilla marketing and paid some influencers on Vine or, I guess, musically, no, TikTok. Sorry, I'm old. If they paid some TikTok influencers to shill their product, by putting them on other unrelated plushes, then I think it could generate some new interests in people who otherwise wouldn't have looked at Build-A-Bears. And maybe, you know, maybe after they buy a lot of accessories, they might look at your selections of bears and pick one out. You could be generating new marks that way. Also, whilst I'm giving Build-A-Bear advice, you would need to fix up your fucking Amazon store. Listen, I get it. The move to online shopping isn't easy for you, but most people shop using Amazon. And the fact that you have a store, but it's useless, is worse than you not having one. You haven't updated the fucking thing since Easter of 
last year. And listen, I get if you don't want to sell the bears on Amazon, but at least sell the clothing. Again, you could make money off of people who don't own Build-A-Bears, but you could get them to get the clothing to put on their plushes and do that whole thing. You're just denying yourself of money at that point. Oh, and uh, Build-A-Bear should do a collaboration with Team Fortress 2, because that fan base is already acclimated to buying ridiculously expensive hats. All right, now I'm going to end this video off by just talking about miscellaneous aspects of the adult collector market that didn't plug in cleanly to anything else I was talking about, but still bother me. I feel like there's this corporate conundrum when it comes to creating a new line of nostalgic toys, because the whole idea with nostalgia collectors is that they were buying toys from their youth. Star Wars collectors weren't just nostalgic for the brands, they were specifically nostalgic for the old Kenner figures. So, how do you go about making a new old thing? How do you go about releasing new things that people will want in the same way they'll want the old stuff? I mean, there's Super 7 with the reaction figures that's kind of like this, where they do it vaguely in the style of the old figures with the old card and the plastic bubble. That's close, but... I feel like the reliance off of that, you know, aesthetic is still its own problem. If you're familiar with the YouTuber Quentin Reviews, there was a quote he said in one of his videos that absolutely changed my life and how I view things. Visionaries of the past use their limited resources to show a future of unlimited potential. And now that we live in a future with unlimited potential, we're recreating the past. And maybe I'm a hypocrite in that regard because, you know, I am one of those people that sees games like Uncharted 4 and Last of Us Part whatever, and they say, why do we need to focus on graphics that are this, you know, level of detail? Why do we need to put peach fuzz on our character models? Why is this important? So maybe it's rich coming from me, you know, demanding innovation from companies, but... At the same time, I feel like culture needs to go somewhere, and currently it's just spinning around in circles. Like, sure, old things are great, but maybe instead of just doing old things over and over again, we should be inspired by them to make new things, taking in the sensibility of old creators and injecting new ideas from new points of view from new artists. Mike, money. our generation will not let our toys go, ever. No, we, we're going to insist that our grandchildren keep playing with our toys. You had to they, like this because I liked it. They can't have their own toys. You need to play with Star Wars and Ghostbusters. Also, why is it that whenever a toy line has an adult variant, the packaging is always the same fucking aesthetic of like the black metallic texture? That's how the bear cave looks, that's how the big bad toy store looks. And one of my subscribers, uh, YouTube Cool, showed me this line of Cars toys, the Precision series, and it's the same fucking thing, it's the black metallic texture, what the hell? Why isn't the packaging fun? I guess for adults, but doesn't mean it still can't be fun, they're toys! Toys should be fun, you're not buying a fucking toolbox! And the other big issue I have is that, well... It's the adult toy market, which I feel like, in a sense, we're leaving behind children too much to focus on the needs of adults. Companies are not making products for children anymore. Even when they're toys, they're for adults still. Because even if a toy is in a child age bracket, it's still trying to market to the adult that's buying for them trying to pander off of what they love. They're not letting children learn to love new things, and I feel like a lot of unscrupulous people are taking advantage of that. On YouTube, we make a big fuss about the content farms and what your children are watching, all those Spider-Man Elsa videos where they pee, shit, and vomit everywhere. Ooh, that went from zero to a million real quick, didn't it? But I feel like those only exist because children are going elsewhere to look for content because the big companies aren't making shit for them anymore. That's why they're watching all this stuff that's really not meant for them. You know, maybe at the end of the day, it's okay to make things for children. Maybe it's okay to empower creativity and wonder in the minds of our youth. Maybe we should be 
focusing more on what they want because they're going to grow up to be the people that run this country. They're going to run the economy. They're going to be our next generation of police and scholars. And we're doing a very bad job giving them hope.